Avatar 2, also called The Way of Water, because apparently there's just like an extra hour of people swimming around for no reason that has nothing to do with the story at all. It opened last weekend to give James Cameron, the director, his first $100 million plus domestic box office. So congratulations, James. The problem is everyone is disappointed. I mean, maybe not some fans. Rotten Tomatoes is giving it some good scores, but all of the Disney shareholders, all of the stocks, everyone is disappointed. Why would that be? How can something open as the third best box office of the year disappoint everyone? Well, it's because expectations are crazy high for it. Why would expectations be so high for this? Well, it's been 13 years. It's been 13 years. It's been so long between the release of the first one and this one, they had to re-release it to remind us what the characters' names were. I mean, hell, like all we remember about the first one was like, hey, way back then, it was like a 3D movie that was really good I and mean, it had some blue people flying around and stuff like that happening, right? There was like some soldiers coming in and some things happening, right, I think? And this is the problem with perfectionism. <laughs> the problem with being a perfectionist is things, you want everything to be so perfect that you miss your window. 13 years. Back in 2018, I took my family to Disney and they opened the big Avatar ride. What was that, almost five years ago now? That was when the movie was supposed to come out and even then it was delayed. <laughs> So yes, congratulations, Mr. James Cameron. You have created another special effects visual masterpiece with a story that is apparently like, okay, featuring some more blue people flying around or swimming around or doing whatever it is that they're doing, living in their crazy 3D world. And yet it's, it's just, I mean, hell, it's taken so long that Eddie Falco earlier this week, she said, <laughs> she said she didn't even realize that the movie hadn't come out yet. She recorded her parts for like movie two and movie four and because they're, they're doing so many of them. She recorded her stuff and filmed her stuff so many years ago that she thought that the movie had already come out and failed, that it had already flopped. She didn't even realize that they had been sitting on it all this time. So good movie, great movie, gonna break all the box offices and become the number one movie for the history of forever. Maybe, maybe, who knows? That's not even the point. The point is, it just took way too long. Of course, the lessons that we can all learn from <laughs> James Cameron and Avatar 2 is that, like, listen, we are not going to suggest that it wasn't a lot of work. And the fact that the movie cost like almost $250 million to make, that it wasn't an investment. I mean, it took a long time, it took a lot of people. They had to wait for technology to come along. I'm not suggesting any of that stuff. Cool, we can applaud all of those things. But if you just focus on that, you're actually missing the lesson and you're actually missing the point. Here's the thing, all of that time and all of that effort and all of those like little tiny special effects improvements, did it actually impact the experience or the story for those who are watching it, right? This is the movie business. When I went to film school because <laughs> a long time ago I went to film school and I remember my professors used to say this is the movie business and they would always say that this is the movie business you're out here to entertain and to tell stories and to try and engage people and to shape hearts and to shape minds and it's a business which means of course we know that people have to see a return on their investment and the problem is that having waited so long and James Cameron focusing on like trying for perfection, and I bet if you asked him, I haven't seen the article, but I bet if you asked him, he's still probably disappointed with what they're putting out. It's still probably not good enough. He's probably thinking like, if I could spend 20 or 30 years on this, I would to create this masterpiece, this vision I have in my head. But the thing is, the longer you wait, the higher the expectations are the more money that's going into it, the higher the bar is that you're setting to impress people. And we're seeing this with the initial box office. I mean, the movie opened the third best opening of the entire year, and yet Disney stocks fell. <laughs> Disney stocks fell to the lowest. <laughs> they closed uh, earlier this week. They closed the lowest they had been since March of 2020. Apparently, <laughs> Avatar 2 can have the same impact on Disney stocks as a global pandemic. <laughs> and so this is the movie business. When you're an entrepreneur, when you're a creative, when you're out there trying to make something happen, you naturally want to put out the very best thing. 
And so you're toiling away and you're working away and you want to make sure that if people are going to see it, they're going to see the perfect thing. This is why perfectionists are often more talented, more skilled, smarter people, but they're less successful than those who just make stuff happen. Because the people who are out there who are making stuff happen, you know, they're just releasing it. They're just building it, releasing it, and going. James Cameron was so focused. This is like a three hour plus movie, and, and everyone's saying that there's an hour of the movie that frankly doesn't really drive the story forward. So James is busy focusing and hanging his hat. He's hanging everything he's got on the environment and the special effects and the shots. And you're gonna go there and you're gonna sit down here and go, wow, this is remarkable. But I can tell you that like focusing on remarkable special effects, well, in 10 or 20 or 30 years, the special effects won't feel so remarkable. I mean, go back and look at a movie from the 80s or the 70s and it's like, go back and watch Air Force One with Harrison Ford and look at how they crash the plane at the end. Spoiler alert, it's not good special effects. Go back and watch a Sean Connery's The Hunt for Red October at the end. It's got this famous scene at the end where they all come up top and they're all in green screen. It is not good special effects. So James is busy hanging his hat on this entire franchise being the special effects which are only impressive today and in 10 or 20 or 30 years will be nothing more than us referencing it in history books. That's what he's dedicating his life towards. I can tell you, having, again, gone to film school and taken film history classes, that the books are filled with movies and films and things that were groundbreaking at the time that you don't even that you don't even know. You don't even know anything about because it's like, okay, cool. This is the first movie to have uh, sound added to it. Okay, I mean, like, cool. A, a technological advancement, right? Whatever it was, 1928 or 1929, this thing has sound added to it. Awesome, cool. Can't even tell you what the movie was. Maybe there's another movie where it was the first movie to have two different storylines going on at the same time and cut from this storyline to that storyline and this one to that one, and, and everyone thought it was going to confuse audiences. I can't even tell you what movie that was. I don't even remember what movie that was. But the classics, the greats, they focus on story. And so James Cameron is the perfectionist. He's off there whittling away and wanting everything to be perfect. He shoots for, you know, movie number two and movie number three and number four because he sees that there's going to be seven. At this rate, the dude is going to be 180 years old. He's going to be like biblically old <laughs> before Avatar 7 comes out. This series is going to outlive him and he's going to have to turn it over to someone else or more realistically, the powers to be at Disney are going to just stop funding this nonsense. And this is the trap of perfectionism. When you are creating your things, building your things, doing your things, you want it to be perfect. But the longer you wait, the higher are the expectations, the higher is the pressure is putting on you, the more money that's debt and, and higher cost is racking up, the deeper the hole is that you're digging for yourself that you have to try and get yourself out of. And that is what's happened with Avatar. Maybe this is going to become the number one movie of all time. Maybe this is going to earn all of the money back. And in a few months, we're going to look back at this video. It's going to age like staled milk. And you're going to be like, Mark, you're an idiot. But the truth is, that no one should have to wait 13 years for a follow-up movie. No one should have to wait for like every little pixel and every little thing to be perfect while ignoring the storyline. None of us should have to deal with that. What do you think? Do you think people should have to wait 13 years for a follow-up movie? I want to hear from you. I think it's a big bucket of nonsense. <laughs> so hey, listen, head over to Instagram, drop me a DM and let me know what you think. Maybe you agree. No one should have to wait 13 years for a follow-up movie with a bunch of people swimming around in blue suits. Or maybe you were like, got your ticket, advanced screening, it's midnight. You're like, I can't wait to see Jake and, um, and Navi and, and all of these people. Uh, I can't wait to spend three hours watching this thing. Head over to Instagram, drop me a DM, and let me know what you think.